So um, thanks everybody for showing up. That's um, when you when you're gonna give a presentation. That's probably the first thing that you that you worry about is is any is is anybody gonna be there when I get there? Um, so thanks for your uh, thanks for your time. Uh, my name is Phil Treach. I've been in the real estate industry in the Austin area f since 1989. Started as a part-time job uh, in college, leasing apartments on weekends and a day and a half during the week. Um, it was one of those accidental um, things that I had some cousins in the apartment industry and I needed a job and they connected me with some people and the next thing you know, um, I've, I kind of found my way into an industry that I turns out I really, really like. Um, I was originally studying to go into psychology and counseling and things like that, and certainly there's an aspect of that in, in our business, but, um, but what I found out was that I really loved small business. I wasn't such a fan of... of uh, gigantic operations that were full of bureaucracy but uh, but the small ones where you could work in a in a team type environment with people and and see the results of of what you're doing kind of it uh, I really enjoyed that so over the years I have been an apartment locator I've been an assistant manager on a 200 plus unit student property in the Riverside and Old Torf area I have been a loan officer, I have been a property manager, a residential realtor. Um, oftentimes these things have sort of overlapped and happened in layers, but um, I've done single family investments, both buy and hold and buy, fix and sell, rehab, flip, however you want to refer to it. Um, done the sort of in between stuff like the duplex to fourplex uh, investments, again, both on a buy and hold or a buy, fix and sell model, and uh, have also done multifamily, uh, typically in the smallish range number of units. So um, the largest project that I've been personally involved in as an owner is uh, 53 units, which we just bought a couple months ago in uh, in Belton, Texas. Um, but I've been around the industry for a long time, and I have a, a I think a pretty good understanding of how it works, and and uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today is investing in multifamily. Um, so um, short kind of PowerPoint presentation and um, won't bog you down with a hundred slides but we'll hit some highlights and have a chance to discuss and if you have questions anywhere along the way feel free to we don't have to save them to the end or anything like that so this first slide just gives you a, a few of the high points that I kind of like when I to to think about when I'm thinking about uh, investing in income producing real estate and really you can kind of take this model and apply it to other product classes it's not exclusive necessarily to apartment communities but that's sort of the focus of this the same basic uh, principles work in self-storage they work in um, office warehouse they work in in all kinds of forms of commercial and uh, income producing real estate so the first point is um, that you can pay for 25 percent of the of the asset up front and then there are hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people around the country and the world who would be more than happy to pay for the rest of it for you um, which is fabulous. <laughs> um, I'm not a huge fish in this market, but I have a few north of a hundred people who every day wake up and go to work and once a month help me pay for assets that will help retire me one day. And I'm very grateful for them. And, um, 
very happy with that business model. Um, most of us, um, most of traditional investing uh, involves us going to work, earning an income, saving a certain percentage of that income, and putting that in, uh, putting that to work in stocks and bonds and things like that. And those are the. Um, not a naysayer of of other types of inv of investing, but um, but most of your contributions on on those fronts are made by your own efforts. Um, so what's one of the great things about real estate is it, it it has lots of forms of leverage. The second point is that uh, your good old Uncle Sam will let you deduct not only the operating expenses, but will let you depreciate the physical buildings and improvements to the property, regardless of the fact that they, in fact, in most cases, are increasing in value rather than decreasing in value. The idea is that things wear out over time and that you'll have to fix and replace and upgrade, uh, which you will have to do. Uh, but on a, from a tax perspective, you get to, to take additional um, uh, deductions based on that. Um, and if you play the game right in the, when you do get ready to sell that property, if it makes sense for you to do 1031 exchanges, um, uh, you can further delay those um, tax implications into the future and if you really pay it, play it right and just leave everything to your heirs, um, they get it at a step, stepped up basis and uh, sort of those depreciation write-offs are Go off right. the books. <laughs> um, of course, you're off the books too, so it's a trade-off. Um, uh, the third thing, the value of the asset and its income stream have historically outpaced inflation, um, typically by uh, at least at least double. Real estate is um, usually a fairly slow-moving game, um, so you you don't often wake up and overnight your real estate values have either gone up 50% in 24 hours or gone down 50% in 24 hours. You, if you're paying attention, you usually get a little more lead time than that. Um, and over time, um, you typically get, um, you get slow and steady um, valuation increases and income increases they have their peaks and valleys, but if you kind of step back and look at the really broad picture, you see that the trend line tends to stay in a range and go uh, sort of slowly upward. If you have leverage, meaning a mortgage and debt on your property, the other thing, the other side of the equation is that that uh, principal balance on the loan, at least in the beginning, starts kind of slowly. Uh, decreasing in the opposite direction and the spread between the two is really where you win in this game and the later you get into the into that mortgage um, amortization cycle the more that becomes an exponential curve downward and paying off the um, the debt and that spread increases more and more each year so I think and most people um, uh, view at least this income producing part of, of uh, real estate separate and apart from if you're uh, fixing and flipping or wholesaling or doing other things that are more short term uh, income oriented um, you need to be in the game for a long time because uh, that's the point at which you really start to, to see the benefit and then the last thing is and this is pretty specific to um, uh, income producing real estate uh, and things that are valued the way we're going to talk about how we value apartment complexes is you can not only increase the value of the property by rehabbing and improving it, you can also increase it by improving its operations. 
And I think that's one of the things that's really kind of unique and very cool. So some differences in mindset in terms of uh, investing in income producing real estate versus what a lot of us have as part of our real estate portfolio, which is our primary residence. So the difference between buying a home, which has emotional components and and um, and some practical things about where you want to be located relative to work and schools and things like that, versus when you're buying an income producing piece of real estate. So the first thing you need to, to, to understand and, and work on uh, mentally and emotionally is when you buy an apartment complex, you're buying a business. Much like if you went out and bought an, an accounting firm or a manufacturing company or um, A tech company but they don't always produce income so um, uh, the the business you're buying is represented in large part by sticks and bricks and grass and driveways and you know things like that but it is a business and you're gonna buy it and evaluate it and try to improve it and ultimately maybe sell it based on its income um, so it's got revenue it's got expenses and if you buy it right it has more revenue than expenses and therefore has value in terms of its income stream relative to single-family homes in areas that are primarily uh, owner-occupant type neighborhoods um, where you're buying something even if you're buying it as a rental property you're buying something that's valued based on what everybody else thinks about living in that neighborhood um, so when we value residential real estate especially single-family real estate we value it most commonly on sales comps so you look at similar properties of similar size as close as possible to the subject property and that's how you figure out what it's worth because it's what the neighbors bought and sold their homes for um, and that's a great way to it's a great way to value properties uh, for that those types of properties and for those purposes um, because if you're buying uh, a KB home in a neighborhood that has 300, 110 of which are the same floor plan built within a year or two of each other uh, with similar finish outs and seven of those have sold in the last 90 to 120 days the market will tell you exactly what that house is worth and it's not it's not very much up for debate unless somebody just wants to come in and pay cash and pay a lot more uh, for the property or or unless the seller is in, in extreme distress and and is willing to let it go um, a little cheaper because they they need out uh, quickly sometimes you'll see an appraisal um, that includes an estimate of value, or you may see appraisals that include an estimate of value based on the re replacement cost, which means if we wiped off the house that's there now and built it back similar based on today's construction costs, how much would it cost us to do that? Usually the weight and the actual uh, valuation is given to the sales comp approach, but the replacement cost may be on there. And in some cases, uh, particularly if you're buying it as an investment property, they may include an income approach, which means they may look at uh, what rents for those types of properties in that kind of neighborhood are going for and try to compare other sales that had similar rental income or derive a value from that rental income. When we... Uh, when we look to value an apartment complex, though, 
it's really hard to use that sales comp approach. In fact, it's almost worthless. Um, the example, a great example is the first apartment community that we, that we did is 23 apartments plus 45 self-storage units plus a third of an acre of vacant land all on the same track in Lamarck, Texas, which is in between Houston and Galveston. And how many 23 unit apartment with 45 self storage and a third of an acre of vacant land in the Lamarck, Texas city area do you think had, had transacted in the six months to a year before we bought that property? At least 15. No, oh, <laughs> it was a little less than that. The answer is zero. <laughs> and there won't be any anytime soon because we're the only one. Uh, that has that that uh, sort of makeup. So what we have to do instead is we have to find a way to value dissimilar properties and compare uh, and and compare them. Uh, the purpose again of the asset that we're buying is to produce income, and we can compare those dissimilar assets based on their income stream because that is a ultimately what it produces in income is is um, irrespective of of most of the rest of the um, uh, aspects of the property so we can use the income streams and compare them and we can risk adjust um, those so if it's a c-class property in a rural area I want a much higher return on my investment than if it's an A-class property in a urban um, metro area, particularly one that's high job growth, high income, all that kind of stuff. So really quickly, when we talk about A-class properties, we're talking about recently constructed full amenities, um, everything from the stuff that you would probably expect to see in every place like fitness centers and pools and and business centers in the office to maybe concierge type services like door-to-door -door trash pickup and um, uh, taking your dry cleaning or arranging to have somebody come take your dry cleaning and stuff like that a c-class property is is the 1960s built flat roof cardboard box with windows um, and zero amenities except maybe a laundry room and probably a pool that was filled in 20 years ago with dirt and is now a garden um, so some of the recent trends that I think favor multifamily investing um, we were all we're I can see we're all old enough to have been here in 2008 when the financial crisis happened and that changed a great deal about how uh, mortgages are done um, it's not that you in every case have to have 20 percent down to do a an owner occupied mortgage you don't there's other options but things are harder um, than they were in 2006 2007 to to get financing and therefore um, there are people who are out of the game of home home ownership because of that um, there's also what I I'm just gonna say this is anecdotal but I hear it anecdotally from a lot of people so for what that's worth there seems to be something of a generational change in the desire for or maybe at least the delay of home ownership mm -hmm. so a lot of people who have the income and the credit and the down payment to buy aren't buying and that's a you know it's maybe a combination of lifestyle choice um, maybe they don't know if they want to be in the same job in the same city three years from now. Um, maybe they don't know if, um, if they believe that values are going to continue to rise because they saw friends and family and things like that get stung in the mid-2000s and lose money on, on uh, their real estate purchases. Um, 
I have heard statistics about the what commonly referred to as the millennial generation delaying um, marriage and having kids and buying houses and things like that. It's not that they don't want to do that necessarily. It's just that they're not in as big a hurry as maybe um, my cohort uh, of, of, of age group people were. Um, and then I think there's some... Uh, so, so those two things, I think, are good drivers for quality renters for many years to come. Um, and, and then I think there's some macroeconomic trends that, that, um, that are good to keep in mind as well. Number one, right now, money's on sale. It's been on sale for years. Uh, probably it'll be on sale for at least a little while longer. And even when it goes up in price historically, it's going to still relatively be on sale compared to what it uh, what it's been over the last 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, eco boomers, or and I guess I don't know exactly where the cutoff on eco boomers and where that overlays with millennial, but nonetheless, um, there's a a generation younger than I who's actually larger than the current baby boomer population. Uh, and if they kind of continue to, if a higher percentage of them continue to choose to rent rather than own, for whatever reasons they're making that choice, then we're going to probably have a healthy uh, uh, group of renters for, for years to come. And then... <coughs> The baby boomers who are retiring, we're seeing a lot of downsizing and we're seeing a lot of moving to be close to kids and grandkids and a lot of wanting to simplify life to enjoy retirement. I hear a lot of people refer to it as wanting a lock and leave home meaning if you want to go travel for three weeks or a month or go see the, um, the, you know, if your kids are spread out around the country and you live close to one set and you want to go spend a couple of months being close to the other set, the idea being that you can leave and you don't have a tremendously large yard to care for, you don't have uh, a pool to care for, you don't have a bunch of things that you have to worry about at home while you're traveling or or visiting folks or whatever. Um, so I think all of that tends to, to tell us that we've got um, a good pipeline of, of qualified renters for a long time to come. So back to the way we value um, income producing real estate. Um, we do that, we, com we make those comparisons between income streams based on what's referred, what's called a capitalization rate, but is generally referred to in short as the cap rate. Um, and the formula for cap rate is the net operating income of the property divided by the value. Value could mean sales price if you're in the process of purchasing the property, or value could mean um, the valuation for purposes of refinancing or, or things like that. Um, and so let's break that down a little bit. Your, your net operating income, or in short, we people refer to it as the NOI, is all of your income on the property minus all of your expenses. Your incomes, in, in most cases, are primarily rent, but they can also include things like laundry and vending income. They can in include um, application fees, late fees, um, uh, parking. Yeah, covered parking, or if their property includes storage, um, if you if it's a property where the tenants are billed back for 
a pro rata share of water bills or trash bills or things like that. There's several sources of income that you could have, but your primary one is your rental income. Your expenses include everything except the principal and interest on your mortgage payment, on your debt service. So it includes your property taxes, it includes your insurance, it includes payroll for any on-site staff you might have. Uh, repair and maintenance costs whether those are materials for your maintenance person to use or whether they are things that you contract out to outside uh, vendors like um, uh, heating and air conditioning companies or heavy plumbing bills things like that um, it includes utilities administrative expenses which would be paying uh, the accountant to do the tax taxes at the end of the year um, keeping the office supplied with copy paper and ink and uh, and phone lines and that kind of stuff it includes advertising and marketing um, contracted services which are things like pest control and landscaping and things that happen on a recurring basis that you use somebody that's not on your payroll to handle for you um, and depending on exactly who's doing the underwriting um, it includes a reserve for future replacements what that means is it's your savings account for when you get hit with the big ticket stuff like roof repairs and siding and exterior paint and things that don't happen every year but happen every 5, 10, 15, 20 years and you need to have the money available to, to be able to pay those things. So next, if we rewrite the formula for cap rate, and I'm sorry but I'm going to hit you with what I if I remember correctly, this is algebra, right? <laughs> it's been so long that, but I'm gonna hit you with some high school level math at least. Um, if we rewrite that cap, cap rate formula, we get that the value of the property is equal to the net operating income divided by the cap rate. So an example is, if we have a property that produces a hundred thousand dollars in net operating income and we want a 10 percent cap rate for the market says a 10 percent cap rate is appropriate for that product for that type of property in that location then that property is worth a million dollars um, the easiest way the quickest way that I wrapped my head around what a cap rate means and and helped me in analyzing properties is just to think of it as if I pay cash for the property, meaning I don't have any debt service, it's my cash on cash return for the year. So if I paid a million dollars for the property and I have an NOI that's $100,000, which is all my income and expenses except for the debt service, which I don't have because I paid cash, then I've got a 10% return on my investment and that's a 10% cap rate. So um, it takes a little practice and analyzing a lot of properties to where, it just, to where that valuation model just becomes ingrained and automatic, but, um, but that's how it works. So if we want to increase the value of the property, um, the primary thing, we, there's two ways to do it. The way we have some, some uh, real influence on is to increase the net operating income. The other way is to reduce the cap rate. Well, that's, that has to do in some degree, and we'll talk about this with what what interest rates are on debt service and what other people are willing to pay for properties and returns that they're looking for. But the primary way we look to increase the value of the property is to increase the net operating income. 
And the way we do that is we either can focus on increasing revenues or focus on decreasing expenses, or ideally we do both at the same time and we get kind of a um, uh, leveraged effect. So I know this is kind of small, um, but I'll talk, you, I'll talk you through the, through the numbers. Um, this is an example of a property that we just bought a few months ago. It's south of Houston. It contains 14 units. Um, the property was on the market, listed on LoopNet with a large national apartment brokerage. This was not a secret hidden deal um, underneath a bush somewhere that we either lucked upon or had incredible insight and found. Um, oops. So on the left hand side, this is our what we expect the property to do initially when we buy it. We bought this with a hard money loan, which means expensive money, um, but it needed a lot of work and, uh, and the numbers made sense. So we went ahead with that because that was an easier way to acquire the property, get the work done, and then we'll look to refinance out. So our purchase price on this was $4.95. Um, we anticipated acquisition costs of around $5,000 and loan fees and costs because it's a hard money loan of a little over $13,000. Um, and our plan was to spend $10,000 per unit on rehab. Uh, so we have a $140,000 rehab budget. Our um, our hard money loan is $475,000, uh, and then we wanted to have some initial operating funds just so we didn't walk into the deal broke. Um, that's never a good idea. So in total, uh, we put together $200,000, um, and based on the rental, on the rent roll of the current leases and current tenants when we bought the property, it should produce $96,000 in annual rental income. We put an 8% vacancy factor in place. You always have vacancy even when you're 100% full. And the reason you have vacancy when you're 100% full is somebody's going to move out, somebody's going to move in to replace them. You physically might be 100% occupied, but you've got a week or two or three weeks worth of vacancy in there that that uh, happen as part of the natural turnover and churn that happens when people move in and move out. That left us an effective rent income of 89000 and change. Other income on this property is primarily billing back for water. Um, the tenants pay a, uh, a share of the water bill. Uh, but it also can include late fees and, and application fees and things like that. So that gave us a gross, uh, estimate a gross operating income of 99570 And then here's all our operating expenses. Real estate taxes and insurance. These were our estimates going into the deal. Um, in this particular case, 14 units um, almost never makes sense economically to have an on-site manager. Um, not that people don't do it, but the numbers just typically don't work out um, to, for it to make sense. So um, my management comp our management company is managing the property. Uh, we happen to own another property in a neighboring city where we do have an on-site manager and so we're leveraging that a little bit and paying him out of our management fees to, to, um, to do that. Repairs and maintenance, uh, that's for your normal regular stuff outside of the rehab. So um, that's for fixing the leaks or um, the air conditioner when it goes out and that kind of stuff. Uh, utilities is mostly water. There is one outside house electric meter there that does the outside lighting. Uh, and again, like we talked about, things like administrative advertising and contracted services. That left That's total operating expenses of around $42,000, which would leave a net operating income of $57,000. 
skip down to the bottom, if we use a 10% cap rate, that would mean in our estimation based on a 10% cap rate, the property was actually worth 575 when we bought it. We bought it for 495. But it's in a small kind of rural, uh, semi-rural town, so realistically maybe it should have been valued at an 11 or 12, which would put it more in line with the price we actually purchased it at. Our hard money debt service is 61000 a year, so the day we buy this thing it loses $4,000 a year um, because of the way we financed it. We knew that and that was fine. Um, because I'm a PC guy, so say, when, it's, when the hand's up there, you can drag it. Uh, oh, I can do that too. <laughs> okay, um, so here's our prospectus. Um, once we've finished the rehab and we have the new market rents in place, which we think will take less than a year. And thankfully, we're on pace, or actually ahead of pace. Uh, we still purchased the the property for four ninety five. When we refinance it, we're going to have another set of kind of loan fees and and uh, costs that are associated with that refinance. Um, I left the rehab number in there just to get the calculation of what cash we'll have left in the deal, because that was sort of part of 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 the overall calculation. Our new mortgage um, on upon refinance um, we anticipate will be $470,000. The four seventy five dollars when we purchased it with the hard money, that actually includes the, the one forty dollars in rehab is built into that loan amount because they, they escrowed the rehab money for us and gave it to us as we completed things. So that's why that num that new mortgage is, is actually slightly less than the than the first one. That's um, so when we do that refinance, essentially we'll be pulling back out the 140 that we that we built into the uh, to the hard money loan. So we'll only have 178 thousand of actual cash left in the deal. Um, our new rental income based on market rents will have gone up from ninety six nine to one hundred and thirty thousand eight hundred. We're still assuming an eight uh, percent vacancy and collection loss. Uh, we kept the other income number the same, which means our gross operating income went up from ninety nine to one hundred and thirty, or will go up to. Um, you can see our operating expenses didn't change, don't change much. Um, there's a little bit of an increase in the management fees because um, they're based on the collected rents. So as the rents go up, the management fees go up a little bit. Um, I have estimated an increase in, in property insurance and taxes um, just based on on those costs uh, going up over time um, and so that that has our total oper expected operating expenses at 52,000 which means our net operating income would be 78,175 again skipping to the bottom line if we use a 10% cap rate on that $78,000 uh, NOI, that means the property's worth now 781. If we paid 495 and we put in 140 uh, in rehab, that means we put about 640 to 650 into the deal and created 130 or so in, in equity by rehabbing and leasing to market rents. And that's really where the sort of the beauty of um, of this kind of investing is because some of that is due to <laughs> physical rehab that we did to the property but some of it is due to um, is due
due to operations, meaning getting market rents the way they uh, should be. The previous owner hadn't spent any money on the property in a very long time. Um, sculpted shag carpeting and uh, <laughs> big Adams family door pulls on the kitchen cabinets um, are a couple of those examples. And for some reason now, I'm while you're on that page, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. You said the purchase price, I can't read it, is 460 495 495 And you uh, have 140000 budget for it, the rehab. Uh -huh. And it's in a hard money loan, which the rehab is in escrow. How much money did out of pocket did you have to put into the deal? We put in 200000 total. So if you take the, the purchase price of four ninety five, uh -huh. add two hundred to that, that's six ninety five total. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. and our loan amount was four seventy five. Uh -huh. So out of the six ninety five we put in two hundred, that brings it back down to to four ninety five. So we 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 essentially financed the the rehab money into the Hard money loan, and um, it's and the hard money contributed maybe a two sixty or something like or two ninety to the deal. Right at close. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. You got it. I have a few questions on this page sure. as well. Um, <coughs> how long you had the property? I think you bought this uh, same year. July. Okay. So on that first sheet, how close were you to those numbers, and how did you derive them when you were looking at it the prospectus? Um. It's a little early to say for sure um, because um, we uh, we've already turned over we've already turned over four of the units, um, most of which were internal. Tra once the tenants saw what we were doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to move into a rehab unit and so pay the market rate. Paying more, sure. Um, so Anybody. most of those were internal tra uh, transfers and were in process on another four units right now, okay. three of which are vacant and being remodeled and one of which, as soon as okay. one of those is complete, a tenant's going to move in and we'll start on their unit. So we've been kind of... Um, so I guess my, my question is, how do you feel comfortable on those numbers? Like, say you're looking at it, they could be way off skewed one way or the other, I guess. Sure. So how do you feel comfortable when you're making that investment um, of, we looked at the numbers right? And, right. So on numbers. the on the rent right. side, but it doesn't mean they're actually like, what happens in real life. Right. And <laughs> trust me, they're always not what happens in real life. I mean, they're, right. they're plus or minus. Right. But I want a comfort level and like, this is sure. what I know I should look at when I'm looking mm -hmm. at this investment. Exactly. Know, that somebody didn't fudge these numbers. And the thing that, um, so on the rental income, the way we the way we underwrite the deal and analyze it is, I'm going to look at what their current leases and rent rolls say as at the, the rents are. Simultaneously, I want to do a market analysis of other apartment communities in the area to see what they're getting in rents right. and that way I know are we at market 20% below or are we above for right. some reason because sure. they did a bunch of lease concessions and kind of pumped up the rents or something like that. Um, the, the operating expenses um, the taxes are fairly easy to estimate because you can look that up with the with the county and see what they paid in 2014 and depending on where you are in the year you can figure out what the uh, assessed value is for 2015. Insurance was is actual quote um, basis. The management fees, whatever your management fees are, they're going to be a percent percentage of uh, of the collected rent so it's an estimate based on your rent collections being accurate but the, right. the percentage number is known 
The rest of them, I typically use the National Apartment Association survey information. So um, there's a there's a National Apartment Association, a Texas Apartment Association, and then local apartment associations like Austin or Central Texas or Galveston County right. or wherever. Um, every year, the National Apartment Association does a survey of um, of their members, and they get back thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of responses of what their operating expenses are. Crunch the numbers in an average. And they conglomerate all of that. Um, and I, I, I look at what the current owner's operating expenses have been to the extent they can provide them. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, a 14 unit deal that's owner managed, is, you're not gonna get as good of financial information as you are on a 100 unit deal professionally managed by a third party that and they, they try to get more more attractive than it actually is. Yeah. Sure. They may they may have been avoiding spending money for any number of reasons. They don't have it. Uh, they don't want to spend it. They're trying to make the property look like it earns more than it does. Um, so some of that's ethically not 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 very um, admirable and some of it's just sure. you're not spending money right. and if you didn't know any better and you just went off of what they spent you know, they may be under spending on repairs and maintenance which means you got a bunch of deferred maintenance that you're gonna have to right. deal with so you think it's um, 50 it's really 100 right so I look at their numbers I compare them with the National Apartment Association survey information is, and I look at a lot of, of multifamily deals throughout the course of a given year, and I see a lot of financials from other owners. So you get a sense for, if somebody's telling me that they're operating an apartment complex and the operating expenses are 2200 per unit per year, and I know the National Apartment Association and 90% of the prospectuses and financials that I've looked at are at 4,000 to 4,500. Yeah. I smell a rat. Sure. <laughs> um, and you should too. Yes. Um, okay. If somebody tells me that the vacancy factor that they're using is 3%, I'm not okay with that. Right. I mean, I use eight because that's more conservative than what most people <laughs> use, which is or five in, in a market like we're in now. Um, but you can have a you can have a, a type of property in a location that runs fifteen percent vacancy and collection loss. And they met people living here who aren't actually paying. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sure. Um, so that's kind of awesome. Thank you. That that's kind of how I uh, how I go about it. Um, so if anybody um, gives you a presentation and says there's no downside risk or says they've never lost money or that they've never bought a piece of property that they wish they didn't buy, <laughs> you should be skeptical of the rest of their presentation. <laughs> so there are downside risks to investing in multifamily uh, income producing real estate. One of those is cap rate risk. So we talked, we kind of defined what a cap rate was and how to calculate it. <coughs> and right now, an insurance company or a pension fund or a hedge fund might buy a two-year-old apartment complex in a fabulous location with a boatload of amenities and a very high tenant profile on a 4% cap rate, which means if they paid cash for it, they're gonna get a 4% return on their investment. I won't do that deal, number one. <laughs> I can't do that deal, because <laughs> um, I'm not, not even fractionally capitalized like that. Um, but you have to think about what their alternatives are. They can't go into the 
to the treasury and bond market and get a low risk return that's greater than that. Um, and they have to put that money to work to get some kind of a return to fuel their uh, their members' retirements or their customers' claims against insurance or whatever. Um, a 4% cap rate is very low, which drives the value of the property very high. In the 80s, you might have seen cap rates 14 to 18%, depending on the property class and, and where it was located. Um, so part of that is, is competition. Part of it's a supply and demand thing. Uh, part of it is what, what the particular buyer of the property, what their alternative investments are and what the returns are on that. Um, your mitigation strategy for that risk is making sure you're choosing the right financing for what your plan with the property is. If you are supremely confident that you can get in and out of this deal in three years and you want to put a loan on this property that had that's fixed for five years, there's some risk in that, but at least you've got low interest rate money for five years and you think you're out in three. Um, if you think you're going to hold this property for 15 years, you really should try to find financing that's fixed for 20 or 30. Um, and your plan should be to be paying off your loan so that you don't have interest rate <coughs> risk. We all think that interest rates will go up we don't know how high, how fast, when they'll flatten out again, if they'll ever dip back. Will we see, I mean, my parents in the, in the mid-80s were waiting for interest rates to drop below 12% before they locked their loan on the house that we bought. Because they had been 18. <laughs> and they've gone down pretty much ever since. Um, but there's a, there is an actual mathematical limit. Well. I guess you um, go into negative interest rates, um, but the, that's not very likely. Um, so piggybacking on that, there's the risk from the wrong financing. So uh, if you're making if you're making really aggressive assumptions, or if you're taking really aggressive forms of of debt, um, and and interest rates do start to rise, and your deal becomes skinnier because of it, that's a, that's a legitimate risk. Um, there's risk associated with the location of the property um, and jobs and demographics in that area. So if you compare, there is opportunity in Detroit, Michigan. But if you owned it in 2001, you probably aren't too happy that you own it now. If you buy it now when it's pennies on the dollar and bet on the upside, you might be really happy with it. But if we look at it just kind of from the perspective of, generally speaking, a lot of jobs were lost in, in that area of the country. Um, a lot of people moved away from there as a result of lack of jobs and income. Uh, and a lot of people have been coming to Austin for jobs and income and, and uh, other decisions on where they want to live. So uh, there's definitely uh, risk associated with, with uh, those factors. There's risk associated in managing the operations of the property. So if you're going to invest in, in multifamily, you need to learn enough about it so that you know how to check on things to know if, if, if the management and operations are getting off track. Uh, you need to know how to arrange for uh, the staff to be shocked, meaning either you pay somebody or you have a friend call and find out how do they answer the phone. Did they invite somebody to come take a look at a unit and 
or are they answering the phone in a in a grumpy, sleepy voice and, and not trying to set appointments to lease your apartments? Um, you need to know how the budget and the financials work and, and some feel for what things should cost so that when you see your monthly statement or your year, year end statement and the repairs and maintenance look wildly out of control, you need to be able to figure out what's going on and how to, how to root that out. Um, and one of the most, uh, one of the biggest risks is underfunded deals. Um, I often wonder when I see a new restaurant open up and I never see an ad. Not in the paper, don't hear it on the radio, don't see it on TV. The assumption is build it and they will come. And there's either, there either is no marketing budget or the marketing budget is way too low or they spent it on something else. Um, so don't bring a gun to a knife or a knife to a gunfight. Um, make sure you've got the, the wherewithal to get through the, the rough waters. The other side of that coin is what are the upside opportunities? The first one is the sort of the holy grail of income investing in real estate is <clears throat> if you find a deal that's good enough and you put the plan in place and execute and it goes well, and you can refinance your money back out of that deal so that you have zero cash in the deal, and you can take that money and go find another great deal with a great plan that works perfectly, <laughs> and ladder, rinse, repeat several times. If you've got no money in the deal and you're making money off of it, it's an infinite return because you've got no cash in the deal. Um, and you're churning the same number of dollars to create more opportunities and more sources of income. They don't always work that way. <laughs> um, in fact, it doesn't work that way all that often. It works to some degree in that direction if you do it right, um, but that's, that's sort of the holy grail. Um, you, you've got potentially higher than market cash on cash returns in, in this type of property class. When I find uh, single family homes uh, as investment opportunities for our clients that we manage properties for, I'm typically finding in the Austin area, I'm typically finding three to three and a half percent cash on cash returns. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad investment because there's also the principal reduction of paying down your mortgage over time and there's the appreciation of prices over time and there's tax advantages and there's other factors that, that make that total return higher. But cash on cash wise, it's just hard because there's a lot of people that are paying top dollar retail prices for owner occupied homes and it makes finding rental property homes more expensive. Um, it's not uncommon to find an apartment investing opportunity where you can do 10, 15, sometimes north of 20% cash on cash returns. They may take some work to rehab and reposition and, and improve to market rents to get it there. It may not be there that first day, um, but the opportunities can be there. Um, the warm, fuzzy upside opportunities are you can oftentimes make a difference in a community by improving the quality um, of housing opportunities. So we can take things that were neglected with roof leaks and, and uh, just conditions that people that don't want to live in but maybe didn't have choices and, and we can improve those and, and make for better housing opportunities. Um, there can be multiple exit strategies on multifamily. So just because you buy it as an apartment complex doesn't mean it will always and forever be an apartment complex. It may one day make sense to sell off individual units as condos. It may one day make sense that you, if you own it long enough that um, 
something else is a higher value piece of real estate and development on that, and you've essentially done what we call a covered land play, which means you bought something that created income to pay for itself, and the land appreciated a lot over time, and now the dirt's worth more than the building. Um, and or you may have a complete, you may from the beginning have a complete redevelopment uh, idea in place. Sometimes people buy what's today an apartment complex and eight months from now it's something entirely different or it's redeveloped with retail on the price level and housing above or different things like that. Uh, another potentially warm, fuzzy upside opportunity is if you have other aspirations that work in the housing industry, um, you may be able to leverage an investment to do other good. Um, we all, almost always, um, when we do a deal, we're putting in low flow shower heads and high efficiency toilets and we're fixing water leaks and doing things that are that feel good to, to do as far as conservation and energy efficiency um, and they oftentimes help the bottom line and improve the investment but they also just feel good to do uh, kind of makes me cringe when I go someplace that has a three and a half gallon flush toilet and I just hear a lake <laughs> emptying after you know after you go to the restroom. So I like uh, I like what we've been able to do in some of those cases. And then just the fact that it's a it's it's potentially diversifying your investment portfolio uh, relative to other things like equities and bonds and annuities or insurance products or things like that. So if I like the idea of investing in multifamily, how do I get started? What do I do next? Um, so common questions, how much money do I need? How much of my credit and income are required? How much experience do I have to have? Uh, so let me skip to the second point with regard to deal size. So. If you, depending on where you're looking and the size of the property, you can do one by yourself out of the gate. It may require as little as fifty or hundred thousand dollars in investable capital. It might only be five to ten units, and it might be in a location that's less expensive than the Greater Austin area. Um, but it is entirely possible to to do it uh, on your own without millions of dollars. Um, but there's also opportunities uh, to participate in deals that are larger where you might not have the experience or all of the money or all of the income and, and credit requirements. And that's the point about a pa active versus, versus passive investor. Um, there are individuals and groups and organizations that go out and find deals and put together groups of people who want to participate in them um, at different uh, investment levels. Uh, and those people that go find the deal, do the analysis, come up with the private placement memorandum, put together the, the pool of investors, and uh, do all of that work are obviously the active, the active part of that. Um, they typically uh, get a participation percentage in the deal. They may or may not put money in the deal themselves personally, um, and uh, but at the same time, there are opportunities where people can put in twenty-five, fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars to be a participant in a deal that might be 400 units and cost $12 million. Um, so it's not impossible to start uh, with, with not being Donald Trump. Um, uh, and then my last point under that is uh, a lot of people get started in it by 
starting in single family duplex, fourplex type properties, and then they've amassed a few of those and built up some equity and they want to bridge up to uh, a different type of property class, they might sell those properties, trade in their four greenhouses for one red hotel. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then what do you do to learn more about? Um, there's all kinds of self-study opportunities, whether it's uh, physical paper books, web resources, uh, local clubs and meetups like, like these sorts of events. And uh, you can join the local apartment association um, and you can participate in their education uh, opportunities and their networking opportunities and things like that. Uh, I know for sure you can join the Austin Apartment Association with one rental house. I guess you could probably tell them, hey, I'm going to buy one. <laughs> and they'd probably take your money then, too. Um, uh, there are coaches and mentors that specifically uh, have programs directed uh, toward the apartment industry. And those might be... Uh, few hundred bucks a year for an entry level uh, membership that gives you access to some information and they might be tens of thousands of dollars if you want one on one uh, hand holding on large deals and things like that. Uh, depends on who you're getting it from, the level of service they're offering, uh, and what they can demand in the market. Um, and then there's just the other uh, folks that you would be dealing with in a transaction that would be on your team. So uh, an agent or broker that uh, would help you find deals. Uh, your lender, particularly in this arena, um, can, be a, can help you to not make mistakes. <laughs> because they don't want you making mistakes with their money, so they also kind of help you to avoid making mistakes with your own money. <laughs> I've found them very, uh, I've, I've had lenders that have helped me renegotiate deals by saying, hey, I, I just, I think you can get a better deal, I think you need a better deal, so why don't we, you know, they play the bad cop and say, hey, we can't, we can't fund this deal at this price, but we can fund it at this price, and." Lo and behold, the seller, um, it's not me trying to argue for a lower price for the sake of arguing for a lower price. It's the lender saying we can't do the deal if you don't come down. Um, and then attorneys, CPAs, uh, insurance agents, um, lots of people on your team that would help you uh, uh, learn more as you go through the process. Yeah. Questions? Yes. yes. One of the things that, to me, is the most important in uh, this is the cap rate. And it looks to me like it's kind of almost a Ouija board type of number. How, do, how does that cap rate establish so that you can know how you know, value it's their a, property. Uh, it's a fabulous question. And you're absolutely right. It's a made up number. <laughs> <laughs> um, the cap rate is, um, so there, there may be a market cap rate that other deals have sold for. So if you're looking at, uh, 60s and early 70s era C-class properties in the Houston area, you can contact a couple of brokers that do a lot of those transactions and they can tell you the last four or five that we've done like that have have traded at an eight or eight and a half percent cap rate. All that means is that's what those buyers were willing to pay for that income stream on that particular deal. Um, but it does give you a sense for, okay, this seller might might be thinking that they that they're going to get something in that range. Uh, part of 
of defining a cap rate is just part of defining your own investing criteria. Mm -hmm. So if I can go put my money to work in a 10-year treasury at 2.75, I sure don't want to buy an apartment complex for a 2.75 return because I got tenants. To, mm -hmm. yeah, I, mean, well. I don't. I don't. I got a manager that deals with them, but believe me, in some <laughs> to some degree, I'm still dealing with them. I'm just dealing with them through a third party, um, and and there's risk mm -hmm. relative to Uncle Sam can print the money to pay me my 2.75 and and my money back when yeah. the time comes. Um, so for a for a a particular product type in a particular location, what's happening with jobs and population and things like that in that area, I may want I may be okay with a seven or eight percent cap rate, I may want a ten, I might want a twelve, um, depending on those factors. So to some degree it's up to me. The cap rate's up to me, what I want to offer. Uh, to some degree, there's a market aspect to it, depending on what things have sold for uh, that, are, that are somewhat similar. So there is a sales comp aspect to it. And part of it is, what do I think I can do with the property, and how will it perform when I'm kind of maximizing it? So it might only be, 7% cap rate today, but if I see enough opportunity in the deal that I can improve the income, it might ultimately be a higher cap rate than that when I get finished improving uh, the operations. Uh, so it's it comes from a lot of different sources. The lender may want to see a certain cap rate. Usually they're more concerned about what we call a debt coverage ratio, mm -hmm. which means they want your net operating income to be a to be more than your debt service and they'd like it to be more than by a factor of usually at least 20 or 25 percent more than your debt service. Um, but they may, in, in the appraisal process, that they may have some say in what they think the cap rate should be. Um, and when interest rates ultimately go up, cap rates will kind of go up. Because if they don't, then it makes no sense at all to leverage on a, on a deal if you don't get a better return by borrowing money than by paying cash. So that means the value of your property goes down along with the rise in cap rate. It, so you're, it can, depending on how fast interest rates rise relative to the rise in rents, uh -huh. Because if, if interest rates gra rise gradually over time, but rents are rising equal or better rate, then, you're, then you're good. You, you may not see a, a negative effect on valuation. If we wake up uh, a year from now and the interest rate to borrow money to buy an apartment complex goes from four and a half or five percent to eight percent in that short a period of time, well, people are going to be underwater. <clears throat> because the alternative will be the hedge fund and an insurance company is going to go put their money in, in a treasury bill at five and a half percent <laughs> rather than, you know, rather than loan on a apartment complex that, that has, you know, a loans. Yeah, most projections, I guess, yeah. are about that's six or seven years out from now. But. And usually with increasing interest rates, 
there has been inflation, and inflation typically affects rents. So we're, we're all to some degree in a, in a fortune telling <laughs> or an attempt at fortune telling position, but, but yeah, you're right. It, it depends on uh, a lot of factors, and <coughs> it's really just a way to kind of currently compare alternative uh, income streams and what value do I do I put on that income stream? Anybody else have questions or yeah, just go ahead. No, you're mm. okay. Um, just a quick question: Do you tend to buy an apartment complex and hold on to it for the long haul, or do you tend to try to buy maybe a sea level apartment complex, um, raise the value of it, so to speak, and then maybe sell it in five years from now, where the property value now has gone up and, and so forth? So, um, a lot of people, their, their model is to buy a property that, that has about what we call value add potential, meaning we can make physical or operational or both improvements, drive up income, drive up value, and then sell in four to five years, and then go find the next one. Um, my personal philosophy is I like going into a deal with the idea of holding it long term. What that means to me is if I, if I think I can get in the deal, get really good financing, have a nice cash on cash return that I'd be happy to have for years to come, um, then I don't need to sell in a certain time frame. And when I see a larger, better opportunity, we can sell and trade up into another deal. Um, but I don't, I don't want to buy the deal only with the idea of trading up because what if that opportunity isn't there at that time frame. Uh, I, and I'll draw back to an analogy. Uh, I had some single family and duplex properties that I owned in 2005 that I sold. I, I know why I sold them when I sold them. Um, I felt like the values were good. Um, having the money was was attractive at that time. Um, the regret that I have is that I didn't take that money and reinvest it in a new deal. So what what was a gain in equity became spent consumer money, and it's out the door and. I probably still own a few of those trinkets and shiny, <laughs> shiny things, but they don't produce any income. And I can look back at that time frame and go, wow, if I held one of those properties, my net worth would be X higher, and my current cash flow would be X higher. So um, but at the same time, a lot of the properties that I own right now are on the market for sale. The difference is that money is going to be reinvested into a new and larger deal as opposed to getting spent. <laughs> um, so it's real, I, I really look at it from the perspective of I like the idea of long-term passive, relatively passive income. I want to buy my deals based on that. And then if an opportunity comes up where I could sell that and trade up into a larger deal, then great. We'd be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Sure. I'm just curious with you know the push today for density in the core and, and if there's an older, kind of like you were talking about, maybe a class C property with these really outdated floor plans in terms of a value add or an approach to, you know, you can always cosmetically improve the appearance mm -hmm. of, of these units, but if the floor plan just isn't as functional as what people want today, um, do you find that in some of the deals you've done or, or deals that may be going on, people are really 
really remodeling it, the whole interior or gutting it or what uh, what have you seen as far as um, the the apartment deals that I've done we've done uh, remodeling and repositioning but we haven't we haven't been reconfiguring floor plans uh, and I'm not I've, I've done some of that on smaller like single-family type projects but I've not done it on on the larger scale uh, ones a couple of thoughts um, one thought is that that, that I'm, I'm hearing a fair amount about people um, choosing less square footage um, to be closer in because they don't spend a lot of time inside their units. They're more experientially motivated in where they live. So they'd rather live somewhere close and, <coughs> and go to Starbucks <coughs> to surf the web or hang out with their friends than have a dinner party at home. Um, so size-wise, I don't, I think there are lots, probably lots of opportunities <coughs> not necessarily reconfiguring size. Opening kitchen to living areas so that there's better, you know, flow in the in the unit. Things there there are some really dated architectural styles and floor plan layouts in those older properties like you're talking about. Um, I just haven't done I have I haven't done those kinds of of projects where we've dramatically changed any any floor plans. Um, so I couldn't speak to that much and I don't do new construction development so just wiping a property and starting brand new is not my wheelhouse so uh, I can't provide much insight on that either sorry oh, that's fine thanks yeah on 1031 exchanges it this is going way back to a book I read a long time ago but uh, Trading, uh, can you actually, if you find uh, someone who has, say, you have a four unit uh, oh, uh, complex and somebody wants to sell their 20 unit complex and for some obscure reason it's not moving uh, for a cash buyer, uh, deals in which uh, instead of coming up with 20 or 25 percent out of pocket, you can trade your four unit uh, complex to the seller of the 20 unit complex uh, as the down payment as part of the deal and do that as a 1031 exchange. Uh, so not being a 1031 exchange facilitator or attorney, <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'm probably not qualified to answer that. I would say this though, There's a lot of creative ways to do transactions, mm -hmm. and I think my sense is that uh, when you get into the commercial side mm -hmm. um, and the investment, the income producing side, where you're not dealing with owner occupant homestead mm -hmm. type stuff, the the agents involved and the principals involved tend to, I think, be a little bit more receptive to yeah. unique opportunities like you described. Um, whether that fits in a qualified 1031 exchange uh, is way out of my scope uh, to answer, but, um, but I, I see people do some interesting and creative things with acquisitions of, of apartment projects. Uh, and I see people more inclined to consider owner financing, uh, more inclined to do uh, a mass 
master lease option mm -hmm. where you take over operation of the property and you have a, a, a pre-agreed sales price that if you're able to do the things with the property that you want to do, then you can buy it for the price and if you're not, then hand it back to them with <laughs> the improvements made and they're better for it and you took your shot, but it didn't work out. <laughs> Is your question more specifically, can you trade a fourplex for a 20? Kind of, yeah. Really. Because I know the answer to that is yes. Uh -huh. the answer is yes. You, you can yeah. trade a fourplex for vacant land. Uh -huh. You can trade vacant land for a shopping center. Uh -huh. You can trade 10 houses for an apartment complex. So there's a wide range. Like kind doesn't mean it has to be exactly like that. Uh -huh. There's a much broader category than that. As a matter of fact, you can do it on oil and gas leases. Uh -huh. You can do it. There's a lot of things that you can actually do, do but the point is uh, that you mentioned is if you're figuring, well, I can, let me see if I can do this like kind of exchange and have this vacation house up, yeah. if that thought's even <laughs> going through your mind, you can't do that. <laughs> no, the, the uh, of course, I don't want to dominate the deal, but the, uh, the book that I read was one in which uh, just a regular guy, not a guy with a uh, you know, 200000 in his checking account that he didn't know what the heck to do with type of person, but the guy that was a post, post uh, carrier or whatever that had a decent income and whatever first bought a duplex and improved it and then traded it in on a fourplex that was kind of underperforming and made a deal with the guy that, hey, I got a great duplex here that's perfect and I'll he upgraded it and, and used that upgrade as a, a move to the next bigger property and then took that property and improved it and made it as his move to the next even bigger property. And, and I think that's a great um, I think that's a great way to think about getting for you know, for someone that may have some single family homes or I just don't know if it fits in the in the I think depending on how it's structured uh -huh. would determine whether or not it fits in, in the envelope of a qualified 1031 exchange. Uh -huh. I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get my hands on a deal summary, feasibility report, PPM documents to model. Lynn, I understand you're building. I'm building. Do you have those things that I could um, template? I have some. I don't have all of them. Okay. So we can, we can talk. Okay, cool. That's it. And one of the, um, by deal summary, do you mean like? Initial deal summary, one page deal summary. Okay. Just to attract. Sure. You know, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've seen a think, wide range. I just want to know what looks appropriate and attracts yeah. the widest audience. And it, it'll depend a little bit on, on uh, probably on who you're presenting it to, if it's a, if it's an audience of people that you know really well, um, you may present it a, a little bit differently than if you're going out to unknown folks. Um, when we've when we've put things together in the past, um, it's. Um, <coughs> I like to do an executive summary that, that just sort of encapsulates, here's what I generally what I think about the deal, um, and then develop that out from there, just kind of the same way my English teacher taught me to write a <laughs> five-page paper was to um, give, give the sort of the outline and the introductory paragraph and go from there. but. Um, Ultimately, if you're depending on who you're presenting to, uh, you may or may not need uh, an attorney to help you make sure that you're in compliance with SEC uh, regulations and that you're not uh, openly marketing a security that you're not licensed to do. Yeah. To do. Qualified investors and all that type of stuff. There's a lot. There's a lot of, of pieces to this. I, I'll say the one thing that, that is consistent across all real estate investing is it's about finding the deal. 
if the deal's right, finding people who are interested, lenders who are interested, all of that stuff is not, I'm not saying it's easy, it's, it takes time and effort and it's execution, but if the deal is right, all of that is, is available. Mm. So deal flow is, as we all know, <laughs> that's where it begins and ends. Um, do you guys hold a workshop to do um, that? I don't yeah. personally, but um, uh, Lynn and I both uh, are members with with some coaching and mentoring programs that that offer that at a uh, at a level that you might be interested in and might get some benefit from. So we can talk to you about that. Okay. Give you, give you some direction on some opportunities sure well can i offer that here can i just say that that i'd like to start a workshop whoever would like to join in the next month we'll do 10 deal summaries that's what you're saying to work through how to do it yeah okay people enjoy that okay we do um uh we do an apartment investing meetup every tuesday uh at lunch at abel's on the lake next door to hula hut well, I'll just say specifically what I'm interested in is off-deal land. Okay. Prospecting for off-deal land. Okay. They'll to develop. So. Okay. Where? Where? Uh, Central. Okay. Central Texas. Okay. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Found a couple already, so. Well, thanks, everybody. Again, thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>